let's just pray together. Precious Lord Jesus, Lord, we're so thankful that you've provided something with inside of us, Lord, that you could feel. Lord, because we know if it wasn't for that, that it would just be like water on a duck's back, Father, and it would have no effect on us. But by your love and your predestination, you've gave us a receptor on the inside of the inside that we could hear your voice, Lord, and it could have an effect on our life. Lord, we would never want to underestimate the value of that, Lord, or never underappreciate what that really means. For we know without that, there would be no purpose. Lord, we would just pray that you would come at this point in the service and just do what only you can do, Father. Lord, we stand here as a mere mortal, Father, totally incapable of doing what is required, Father. But we know that you can. So we just pray that you would come, that you would have your perfect will, that you would speak what you want spoken, Father, and that you would just hear through each and every one that's here that your divine purpose for this service would be accomplished. We just commit ourselves to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you this morning. If you have your Bible, we'll go straight to the scripture. We're going to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to go ahead and apologize for taking so much time for preaching this morning. So that way here in about six hours, I don't have to apologize again. And now that I've scared you to death about six hours worth of preaching, when I only go two or three, it won't seem near as bad. At least that's my thought process. I don't, I don't know if that will manifest or not, but we definitely come with a full heart, a lot of information, a lot of material, and we just want the Lord to have his way more than anything. If, if he would just come and speak for 10 minutes, it would be more than me standing here reciting an intellectual speech for all day or just reading quotes and scriptures. We have to, have to have a supernatural element, and that's what we desire for him to have his perfect will. But I'd like to speak this morning on, on the fifth seal, and there's a couple topics that, that we'll get into underneath of this fifth seal as we move forward. But as our pastor was ministering two Sundays ago on the sixth seal there at the crucifixion, there was just so many things that clicked during that service. It was really overwhelming to me, and I've kind of been beside, beside myself for the last two weeks because it just keeps unfolding. So, as Kyle said, you know, Wednesday we're starting to bite off more than we can chew on a regular routine basis now. But I think that's scriptural because even John in the book of Revelation, it comes to a point he's seen all these things, and finally he comes and there's this great group of people and the angel asked him, you know, who are these? And John just says, I don't know. <laughs> you tell me. So I think that's kind of the point that we're coming to, even as we go higher and higher and higher in Revelation. And it's so wonderful, and we can see that portion so clearly, but it opens up so, other, so many other avenues and other questions that it's just astounding. But we just have to keep walking in the channel that he's in, and he'll make known what is needed to be made known. And we trust him to do that. So in Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word as you would have your seats. And the thought that I want to start with that just really struck me a couple Sundays ago when he was dealing with the sixth seal there at the crucifixion and he was really laboring on the sixth seal and what that meant at the time of the crucifixion. But the thought that just clicked with me during that service was not only was the sixth seal being manifested at that time, but for that particular situation, speaking specifically of the crucifixion and the times surrounding right around the crucifixion, 
Literally every seal was made manifest at that time. And we know that that's not an uncommon thing because as we go back and look at the scriptures, we can track those seals through every situation, through each person, through each pattern, through each time element. But the one that I just really want to focus on this morning is surrounding the first crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And let's go to Matthew 26, and we'll begin there. And I think by doing this, we're going to, I think it will help us and enable us to realize how simple that these seals are made manifest and how simple they can be made manifest in our lives on a daily basis. And that's what I want us to catch. Matthew 26, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called uh, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, I'm sorry, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. So if we remember a couple years back when, brother, when our pastor preached on the series of the seals and he exposed that pattern that was laying in the seals of how Brother Branham would come and even before he would get into the scriptures and the information of the seals, he would start dropping parables in there. And he'd say, now just the other day I was talking to so-and-so. And he would actually loose the seal 30 seconds into preaching. And it just goes over the top of the heads of people sitting there, and it went over the, he- the top of our heads for years and years and years and years. But thankfully, now that we see that key, we can recognize what was going on. And we know that as he took that and he laid that over each seal, how simple, but yet how profound that key was. Because now you realize Brother Brandon will spend an hour and a half breaking the seal in such simplicity that when he, acts, that when he gets to the information of the seal, he'll spend 15, 20 minutes on it, and he's done with it. So it's just astounding that he would waste all of this time beforehand take 15 minutes and break the seal and then close the service. So we have to, as we get into this topic this morning, we have to really let that bear on our mind. And if we will, we'll recognize right here in verse four, the white horse rider just rode. Consulted, they may take Jesus by subtility and kill him. There went the white horse rider. Deception going forth sneakiness going forth. And you can see that the white horse rider never wanted to stay the white horse rider because immediately it said that their goal was to kill him. Who would have thought two of the four horse riders were right there in that verse? But they're clear as day right there. They consulted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. Skipping to verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they coveted with him for thirty pieces of silver. So now just in verse 14 and 15, we recognize that this third horse rider rides because he's dealing with the clergy, and he's trying to sell them salvation. In such simplicity these patterns lay right in there. So now we've already had the first horse rider ride. It showed he was going to end up on the fourth one. We've got the third seal going forth. Let's go to verse 47 in the same chapter, Matthew 26. 26, verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves. What horse you reckon that's riding? From the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hell, Master, and kissed him. 
Notice, when that white horse rider rode, he didn't stop riding. Just because that the goal was to get on the fourth horse, and just because that the third horse had rode, that white horse kept riding. So here he came to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees, and they consulted with deception and subtility. Full-blown white horse. But yet Judas keeps riding to the point that he comes up into the very face of Christ himself and kisses him. So here's the white horse standing kissing Jesus, and the red horse is right behind him. At the same time, I'll just say it like our pastor says it, we have to let carnal thinking just completely go away. We have to get out of the chronological one two, three, okay, now the third one's over, the fourth one's got to be coming. It's not like that at all. It's nothing like we thought, saints. When that first horse starts riding, it just keeps riding, and it keeps riding. You can have multiple situations in your personal life that you are in full-blown spiritual famine in, and there'll be another situation going on that's coming to you on a white horse. At the same time, it happened right here in the Scripture to Christ himself. Coming at him at the same time, same thing will happen in our lives. Hell master and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they, laid hands on Jesus, and took him. Let's skip down to verse 59. Now the chief priest and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. What do false witnesses not have? Let me rephrase the question so you'll be sure to catch it. What are false witnesses in famine of? Black horse rider, riding for all he's worth. One, two, three, four, just right down through there in such simplicity, and it lays right here in one chapter of the Bible in a few verses. In one situation, in one scenario sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. They were so false, they was in famine of false. <laughs> Wrap your mind around that. But found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing, what is it? which these witness against thee. But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee, we touched on this a couple services back, but this is just such an incredible passage of scripture to me. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So as we said last time, here is the high priest of the day standing in front of the living God, demanding in the name of the living God that he tell him if he's the living God or not. If this is not a pale horse riding in its full force, you tell me what else is. He's standing in the face of God himself, literally, and using his name to injunct him and to demand that he tell him who he is. And if you don't think it's a pale horse, look at what Jesus does. He says, thou hast said. He answered him. He gave him the desire that he was wanting. He gave, the, the high priest asked him a yes or no question. Yes or no. In the name of the living God, tell me yes or no. Jesus says, thou hast said. See, saints, once you get on that pale horse, God himself can stand and look you in the face and tell you the truth and you'll never recognize it. When you hit the pale horse, you're done. Brother Branham says death means eternal separation from Christ. God himself cannot get you. He asked him a yes or no question in the name of the living God and Jesus said, yes, thou hast said. And he couldn't comprehend it. Hell horse. Nothing follows but hell. 
thank God a believer cannot get on that horse. I cannot think of anything that would be worse than standing before the face of the living God, asking him if he is the living God, and he tells me, yes, I'm the living God, and I would be so spiritually dead, I would not be able to comprehend that. There could be nothing worse than that, saints, because you're beyond hope. And if you have hope, if you don't even have hope, what do you have? Nothing. You're done. You're finished. There is nothing worse. There is nothing left but hell. Praise God, a believer cannot get there. He'll cut the legs off of that black horse. He'll chop its head off. He'll do whatever he has to do to a believer when they're riding that black horse to keep them from getting on a pale horse. Amen. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What farther need have we of witness? Behold now, ye have heard this blasphemy. What think thee? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Why do you think they thought he was guilty of death? Because that's what the pale horse thinks. The pale horse thinks he's guilty of death each and every time. Let's skip to Matthew 27. Just the next chapter over. Verse 45. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness. What seal do you think we're talking about here? We've just spent, our pastors just spent multiple services on it. I'm not going to lay heavy on this. We see this very clearly. We know what seal this is. There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Ella, Ella, lama sabbathina. I may not have said that right. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Clearly, the sixth seal demonstrated to us here. So now here's a very interesting thing. We've had the first seal, correct? Second seal, third seal, the fourth seal. And we've had the sixth seal. We've had five of the seven seals here in Matthew. But if you look, you'll not find the fifth or the seventh seal in Matthew. Let's go to John 19. John 19, verse 28. After this... Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished. What seal does that sound like to you? You will not find that in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It's astounding to me that Matthew, Mark, and Luke does not record Jesus saying it is finished. Matthew records him saying, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? Luke records him saying that into your hands I commit my spirit. Matthew, Mark, And Luke did not catch the seventh seal. And it wasn't even their fault. Because the pattern ought to be laid out that the bride would be the only one to catch that seventh seal. You have to go to John to catch the seventh seal. He said the same thing, saints. It wasn't like there was two different times going on and some of them heard one thing at this time and then at another time somebody heard this. This was the same situation, the same time, but yet John's the only one that thinks it's important to record. He says it's finished. Wonder why. The scripture is so precisely perfect, it's astounding. It's astounding. There's a couple other things we'll get to along those lines later on. But John is the only one that recognizes 
that these scriptures have been completed, my purpose is fulfilled, it is finished. Seventh seal. But you notice we're still missing the fifth seal. Do you think Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John has that one? Let's skip down to verse 31. Same chapter, verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was on an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might take them away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and the, and the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. This is in the book of John who just loosed the seventh seal. Comes to verse 34. And you will not find this in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John is the only one that recounts that there was one of the soldiers that came, took a spear, and thrust it into the side of Jesus Christ. He had a nail in this hand. He had a nail in this hand. He had a nail through each feet. That's four. But the fifth seal comes. Because the fifth seal is me and you. And that Roman soldier even though he was already dead, has to, has to, has to take that spear and run up through the ribs of Jesus right into his heart and loose that fifth seal. That was his fifth wound, saints. He had to have five wounds because the fifth seal is heavenly representation and laboring grace. Heavenly representation and laboring grace. Those first four seals, those first four horse riders put Jesus laying down on the earth on a cross and tacked four nails, three nails through four parts of his body, the extremities of his body, one through each hand, one through each foot, a total of four wounds. But now... Now the scene changes because he's lifted from the earth and he's put into the heavens and the fifth seal is ran into the bottom of his heart and blood and water comes out. That blood and that water was you and I, saints. And we did not come out on the earth because we are not an earthly people. The Jews are an earthly people. That's why the Jew says, where did you get these scars in your hands? The bride is a spiritual people. They are a heavenly people. Their representation is a heavenly being. He's put into the heavens, and that spear ran into his side. Brother Branham said that he didn't die of the wounds. He died of a broken heart. He, he said the chemistry of his body was so made that you and I could not have the reaction in, in our bodies that he had. He said that it would be impossible for our blood and our water to do that. Only Jesus Christ was physically capable of the blood and the water separating in his body. He said he did that. He died of a broken heart. His heart was so broken that the literal blood and water, the chemistry of his body broke apart and separated, and that's what killed him. Because the wounds did not kill him. The wounds did not kill him, and it's proven because the soldiers were coming to him because they needed to get him off the cross. They needed to kill him. They needed to finish killing him. So they broke the legs of the others, but when they come to him, they said he's already dead. But to make sure, they thrust the spear into his side, and the blood and the water comes out. But Brother Branham says his body had a reaction that ours couldn't have. Because, see, saints, no matter how lonely you are and how depressed you are, you can never be as lonely and depressed as he was because he was God. See, we can get 
as low as low can, and I'm not belittling that. We can get low. I'm not saying it's not a real situation. But we still have God to look to. He came to the point that he says, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? He got to the point that he, he, his father had forsaken him. And it caused, he had no more hope, saints. He was done. If, if his father, for, if our heavenly father forsakes us, you tell me what hope we have. We are done. But he comes to that situation and it causes, see, the reason we can't have that reaction in our body is because we can never get that low. I say, thank God. Thank God I can't have that reaction. Thank God that I, no matter how low that we get, we will always be able to look to him and have a hope. But he has no hope. And this causes a reaction that no other human being can have because no other human being can get in that position. Only he can. And it separates and it causes his death. But even though he's dead, he is dead, saints. Not struggling for life, not a little bit of life. He is dead. And that's still not good enough. Now, even though he's dead, they take the spear and thrust it through his ribs into his heart, and blood and water comes out. Brother Branham says that we were identified in that blood and water. He said because when they pierced his side, they loosed the bride. Amen. That was the whole purpose of that event. They pierced that side. Where is the bride's position, saints? Where was Eve's position? Why didn't they stab him in the stomach? Why didn't they stab him in the head? Why didn't they stab him anywhere besides right in the heart of God? Don't ever belittle your position, saints. God himself thought so much of you and I that even after he had died, he allowed a spear to be ran into his heart so that we wouldn't miss our position. <laughs> Even after he was dead, he had already paid the price. There was no more price to be paid. It was finished. He said it was finished. But I wonder who was really on his mind when he was on the cross. That he would die of a broken heart. And that still wasn't good enough. He would allow them to run a spear into his heart and loose that fifth seal. See, all the other seals had been loose, saints. We just went through them. All the other ones had been loosed. But the fifth seal, the fifth seal is heavenly representation and laboring grace. And the fifth seal always goes into full manifestation after a crucifixion after a crucifixion let's go to the fourth seal brother Branham speaking he says here's the fourth seal open and the rider to the four horses is revealed to the best of my knowledge I have to give a disclaimer here I'm leaning a little bit more towards teaching this morning as you can tell and brother Branham says when you go to teaching you're already on thin ice so he has to have a good pastor to keep him in line. So I am perfectly fine if I get out of line for the pastor to correct me. From the pulpit, I have no shame. He can come up and say, Brother Benjamin said this and it's not right, it's actually this. Now I have a real freedom and a liberty. I can just speak my heart to you. So I'm perfectly fine with that because it's, it's not about being right, saints. It is about being right, but it's not about being right for the sake of being right. It's about really being right. So we're leaning that way this morning. And there's a lot of things, they're heavy and they're deep and we're going to get into them. And if I could just speak it the way that I see it in my heart, there would be zero issues. I know for a fact because the picture and the revelation is precise and it's pure and it's accurate. Amen. But I'm a mortal and I'm a human and I may say something wrong. So I've got, the pastor has full permission to clean up any mess that I make. No shame on my part. He says, in the fourth seal, it's open. The riders of the four horses is revealed to the best of my knowledge. Now, this all takes place on earth. Speaking of the first four seals. 
This all takes place on earth. Next seal we see is in heaven where souls under the altar. Now, just in closing, I want to say these few words here. I got wrote down. We have skipped about on these four seals. Now, tomorrow night, we change the scene from the earth things going on. He looks up here and sees these souls under the altar, the sacrifice altar. He says, we've been on earth dealing with these four seals, the first four seals. But he says, tomorrow night, when we come to the fifth seal, the scene changes. It's no more earthly, it's heavenly. He's saying this in the fourth seal so they'll come with a prepared mind. Because if you approach the, four, the fifth seal with earthly thinking, you'll never catch it. He says the scene changes. And it goes into the heavenlies. See, this is, this is why Jesus had to be lifted off of the earth by the four horse riders and put into heaven, because the scene was changing. The pattern had already been laid down in the seals. See, the word was written, the seals were written well before Jesus arrived on earth. The principles and the pattern is already there. When he comes, he's going to come in that pattern. When we come, we're going to come in that pattern. The pattern is not going to change. They couldn't have left Jesus. Jesus could not have died while he was laying on the earth on that cross. He had to be lifted into the heavens. Had to be. And that's why John was the only one to record that. Because John was the only one that was lifted into the heavens to see it. And now Brother Branham comes to preach the seals, and he thinks it's important to let them know when they're finishing up the fourth seal that the scene's changes and we're going into the heavenly dimension tomorrow. I wonder why he thinks that's important. Because he sees the pattern in the Scripture clearly. We change the scene from the earth things going. He looks up here, the souls under the altar. The fourth seal, spiritual death. Why did there have to be four soldiers at the foot of the cross? Fluke? Somebody called off work? <laughs> no, saints. It was there so we wouldn't miss it. The four lifted him off of the earth into the heavens. I'm not making that up. It's in the scripture. There were four soldiers. You can go back and look at that. The, the spiritual death of the clergy on that day was what put him on that cross. There were four soldiers tacked him to that cross, lifted him up into the heavens. When we see it in this situation, if we can just grasp, if the Word of God is so precise and so perfect that it's right down to these nitty-gritty details, that there has to be four soldiers and they have to lift him off the earth to, run, to display the fifth seal by creating that fifth wound in his side. This is not just some ideas we're following, saints. This is so profoundly perfect, it's astonishing. And you can look at that on one hand and say, okay, well, so what? But if you catch the principle under that, you can look at it and apply it to you. That if he's that accurate and that precise over these little bitty details, what about his bride? What about your life? What about my life? Is there anything going on by chance? If he's that concerned about these little details, if his eye is on the sparrow, what does he think about the details of what you're going through right now? You think it's by chance? I would say that if you would get out of carnal thinking, and get into a heavenly atmosphere, you'll probably see how some of these seals are being displayed in that situation you're in right now. 
I would venture to say that's true. John is the only one to catch this fifth and seventh seal because the fifth and the seventh seal is where the bride's located. We know the bride's located in the anointings that combat the horse riders. But you're not identified in that seal. Are you identified on a white horse with deception? A red horse taking peace? A black horse of spiritual famine? You're not identified there. You've, remember, Brother Brandon says the seals loose the entire Bible, and the end of time message was the revelation of the seals. So everything is encompassed in the seals. So if you exist, you're in the seals. You pick which one you want to be in. I don't want to be in any of the first four. And I sure don't, sure don't want to be under a judgment seal. We know that that judgment seal has an effect on the believer to bring them back. But I'm not identified in trials and tribulation. I'm identified in the fifth seal of grace and the seventh seal of his coming and completion. That's where I'm identified at. So those are the ones that John, funny, those are the ones that John, only John, speaks about. Because that's John's message. Let's go to John 12. John chapter 12, verse 20. I know I'm not running around up here and jumping and screaming and clapping my hands and sweating up a storm, but that really won't do you any good, truth be told. What would do you good if you catch the spiritual principle under this seal? That's what will do us good. John 12 and 20. And there were certain Greeks. Now up to this point, they've been dealing in the Jewish country. They've been dealing with Jews. But now at this point in John 12, here comes some Gentiles. I wonder if the scene's changing. Verse 20. And there were certain G Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. And the same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethesda of Galilee, and desired of him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And again, Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Gentiles come and say, We want to see Jesus. And Jesus' response is, Okay, yeah, bring him on over. No. No, it wasn't. His response, when his, his, his disciples come to him and said, there's Gentiles wanting to see you, his immediate response, it is the hour for the Son of Man to be glorified. You think he said this by chance? No. No. He knows the scene is about to change. The Son of, it is the hour, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. That is his response when a Gentile comes to him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let, me follow, let him follow me, and where I am, there also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this hour, but for this cause, I came unto this hour. I thought you said the Son of Man was going to be glorified. There's nothing glorious sounding about that to me. A corn of wheat, unless it falls in and dies, it abideth alone. He that hateth his life and loses it. He just said, it's the hour the Son of Man should be glorified. See, God's interpretation of glory and glorification is his word being fulfilled. Not us walking around with a smile on our face, skipping our heels on the clouds all the time. We have to take a scriptural definition of what he means. And he gives it to us. 
immediately. Gentiles come, son of man is to be glorified, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abideth alone forever. I'm skipping ahead, but this is the first crucifixion. And remember, we had a prophet come and given an indictment for a second crucifixion. What pattern do you think that's going to follow? What glorification do you think that bride's going to receive? If any man, no, let's skip on down. Father, verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. It thundered while he's speaking to these, about these Gentiles. That's probably coincidence. Others said an angel spoke to him. Oh, that's probably coincidence too because there surely wouldn't be an angel speaking about thunders when there's a Gentile present. It is so precise, it's shocking, saints. It is shocking. And Jesus answered and said, the voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Therefore, I send you Elijah the prophet. And if I don't, I will smite the earth with a curse. It didn't come for his sake. It came for our sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Verse 32, and I, if, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You tell me how important it was that he was lifted up from the earth. You tell me how important it was that he displayed that fifth seal of heavenly representation, not earthly representation, heavenly representation at the time of his crucifixion. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. If I be lifted up from the earth, we know that those first four horse riders overlapped the church ages and rode through the church ages. I'm speaking specifically about that context now. Those, those horse riders rode through the church ages. But Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. How important do you think it is that the end of chapter 3, at the end of the Laodicean church age, that voice says to John, come up higher. How important do you think it is that we come up higher? Because Jesus says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. How do you think that you're going to be drawn under him under a Laodicean condition? It is totally against the pattern of the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. It will not work. We are a spiritual people. We have got to get into a spiritual dimension. Have to. And that spiritual dimension will only come by going through that open door. And there is only one person that opened that door, and that was the lamb through his vindicated prophet. Nothing else will work. Anything else will leave you in an earthly condition, and you will not be drawn to him. It is impossible. In the fifth seal, this is where I want to remind you to reflect back on the principles, on the key that was given us for those other seals where Brother Branham would loose it in the parables. Look how simply he looses this seal to us. He comes to paragraph 44 right at the beginning of the seal. Some of the best friends that I know are Catholics. Do you realize, and the man may be sitting here tonight perhaps, is the only way that we got this tabernacle built because a Roman Catholic stood on his feet in the court there and went to the front for me. Boy, like nobody would do. 
That's right. And they couldn't turn it down. Oh, that's nice. We appreciate that, brother. He just loosed the seal, saints. See, the seal, oh, God help me. The seal was not the information written. In, let me say it. The seal was just not, was not just the information written there in chapter 6. Adam didn't, remember, the seals that were restored to us is what Adam lost. Adam did not walk around in the garden with a book that says the sixth seal is such and such. The fifth seal is this. this. Adam walked around with spiritual principles. Brother Branham says that in the Garden of Eden, there was those two trees stand, standing there in the church age book. And he says those were not literal s- trees. Those, were, those represented spiritual principles. So when we come to this fifth seal, the information that is laying there in symbolic form, yes, that has to be interpreted. Yes, that has to be loosed. But the seal itself is any time the spiritual principle that is under that seal is being spoken about, that is when that seal is being loosed. Does that make sense? So now we can clearly see here in paragraph 44, he just loosed the fifth seal because the fifth seal is heavenly representation and laboring grace. See, he's telling a story about how this Roman Catholic, this dear friend of his, went to the court for him. And he went to the front for him like nobody else could do. Nobody else could do this. Nobody else, nobody else was found worthy to do this. But when he did, they could not turn it down. I thought he was telling a story about how this man helped him get the tabernacle. He was. And if you stay on earth, that's all you'll get. But if you will allow him to be lifted up before you, you will be drawn to him and you will see. What is he really saying to a spiritual people? It's not that he's not really saying this about their tabernacle. He really is. But that is not what we're after. What we're after is we want the seal loosed. We want the seal loosed. And he's loosing it. Let's not just think he's telling us stories. Heavenly representation. This Roman Catholic went to the front for him, stood like nobody else could do. And when he did, they could not turn him down. Skips down to verse, I'm sorry, paragraph 46. Just a few paragraphs after that. A boy that is Catholic, a real royal friend of mine, was talking to me. Remember, those are those key phrases we're looking for when we're reading those seals. Whenever he says, now the other day I was, just the other day I was talking to so-and-so. There it is, saints. Go back and read your seals book. It's there every time. He's getting ready to loose the seal. Was talking to me. He had a certain hardware store before I left. He said, Billy, I know you don't believe in our system of religion, he said, but I'm telling you right now, God has honored your prayer so much for us. I believe that if you get in trouble, has anybody been in trouble? Anywhere in the nation said every Catholic in the country would come to you. Have you ever been in trouble that you needed somebody to come to you? Spiritually speaking, saints, we know those things happen natural, but spiritually speaking, have we ever been in a condition of trouble that we needed somebody to come to our rescue? We needed some type of assistance from another dimension. We needed some type of heavenly representation. We needed somebody to come and go to the front for us like nobody else can do and not be turned down. Paragraph 134, I read the other day, you did. That's interesting. What did you read, Brother Branham? Tell me another story. I would have loved to have been sitting there with the understanding that we have now. Because when he would have said this, I would have probably laughed. And I would have probably said, no, you're not going to fool me. I know what you're getting ready to do. And he would have enjoyed it. 
I know he would have enjoyed it. I read the other day the letter that Mary herself wrote to Polycarp. Remember, saints, let me back up for a second. Remember, he's in the fifth seal, and he's talking about Jews under the altar. What does this and what I just wrote, read to you have to do with Jews under the altar? Seals are to Gentiles. Trumpets are to Jews. Seals are to Gentiles even if it looks like it's to Jews. Because what the seal is is a spiritual principle. And if God wants to use Jews to unlock a spiritual principle and a seal to his Gentile bride, he can do that. And if he wants to use a trumpet that looks like it's to a Gentile to loose it, to bring Christ to the Jews, he can do that as well. Brother Branham said, seals are to Gentiles, trumpets are to Jews. It doesn't matter if we think it looks opposite. Brother Branham said, seals are to Gentiles, trumpets are to Jews. And if we allow that to be true, whenever we pick up this fifth seal, we'll no longer say, oh, Saul's under the altar. What's the sixth seal about? No. We'll say, oh, fifth seal, Saul's Saul's under the altar. What is the spiritual principle of that to me, a Gentile? That's the question to ask. I was reading the other day the letter Mary herself wrote to Polycarp, commending him for being a gallant man, that who could teach and accept the teaching of Jesus Christ, of who was born of her from God. Polycarp was burned. And on his road coming down, he was walking with his head down, and the Roman centurion said, you're an old man and well-respected. Why don't you denounce that thing? He just kept looking towards heaven. And a voice spoke from somewhere. They couldn't understand where and said, Polycarp, don't fear. I am with you. Why is he telling this story while he's preaching the fifth seal? Polycarp is coming down to be burned at the stake. And there is a voice from heaven that comes and says, Polycarp, do not fear, I am with you. Oh. Well, if he's with me, what do I have to fear? It's the spiritual principle under the seal that's being loose to us. Polycarp is on his way down to be burned at the stake. This is a natural event. This is going to take place on earth. You tell me one thing on earth that could have gave him comfort. Nothing. Why didn't the scripture say, or why didn't it say that the voice spoke to him from earth? It's not an earthly voice we're looking for, saints. An earthly voice won't help us. An earthly voice won't help us unless it's backed by heaven. But if it's spoken in heaven first and an earthly voice is just a microphone that picks it up and gives it to us, it'll do us a lot of good. A voice spoke from heaven and said, Polycarp, don't fear, I am with you. Don't leave that at Polycarp, saints. We all have earthly problems. We all were going to have problems that there will be no earthly answer to. If you haven't had them yet, you will have them. If you aren't having them right now, you will have them. I assure you of that. Each and every one of us are going to face earthly, real Problems. They're not going to be made up. They are going to be real. You are going to cry yourself to sleep at night. You are going to worry about it throughout the day. It is going to be real and it is going to be earthly. It is going to be natural and it is going to be tangible. Some of those you may be able to fix yourself. But I assure you, each and every one of us will have at least one that we can't fix. 
because we're the Gentile bride, and as Christ displayed all the seals, we have to display all the seals. And we are going to be put in that position to where we have to have heavenly assistance. We have to have a heavenly representation come and help us with that problem like nobody else can. We can look at that in the broad spiritual application, and that's true. We know that's true. Christ came. He died on a cross for us. He came from heaven. He died on a cross for us. For us, He paid our price, and He went back to glory. We know that's in a broad sense, but it's going to be precise in your life. It is going to be specific to you. Your brother and your sister will not be able to help you with that one because this fifth seal, God is going to make sure you have a revelation of this fifth seal. God is going to make sure you have a revelation that you personally have heavenly representation. He will make sure of that. Paragraph 319 in the fifth seal. Brother Branham says, five, if you know your numerals of the Bible, five is the number of laboring grace. We knew it was the number of grace, but he puts a definition here, laboring grace. And that's what he has done. Now watch, you want to know where it is? Nah, nah, I'm hungry. He's preaching the fifth seal. He says, what's your numbers? Five is the number of laboring grace. Do you want to know where it is? Yes, Brother Branham, I most certainly do want to know where it is. Where is the revelation of this seal? Was Jesus a labor of love? I'm sorry, was Jesus a labor of grace? J-E-S-U-S, five. L-A-B-O-R, five. Is that right? Labor for love for you. And if you get to him, how do you come? By what? F-A-I-T-H-N-L-A-B-O-R. Faith in labor. Is that right? Labor is the number of grace. That's what he said. He didn't say five is the number of grace. He said labor is the number of grace. All right to the believer. Faith in what he has done through his labor. It is the foundational cornerstone of any true walk with Christ. If you cannot have faith, perfect faith, in what, in the simplicity of the gospel, just Christianity 101, if you cannot have perfect faith in what he labored to do for you and paid that penalty in full, regardless of anything you have done or will do, you will never walk with Christ. It is impossible. Brother Branham just said so. He says, if you come to him, how will you come? Faith in labor. You have to have a perfect revelation of that. Remember, he also says in the church age book, if you you accept that, you also accept the fact that you are his righteousness. He says to reject one is to reject the other. See, that's how you can check your revelation if you really have a true perfect faith in what he's done for you is if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I have perfect faith that I am the very righteousness of God. Because if there's a hiccup in that, you need to go back and check your first revelation in faith in what he did. Because you don't have it yet. If you do not, Brother Branham said so, and I'm not making that up. It's in the church age book. He says, if you accept one, you have to accept the other. If you reject one, you have to reject the other. They are intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. That's how you can check your revelation. 
And it's not that we're not going to slip up and mess up and make mistakes. Brother Branham says you will even willfully sin. I'm not going to try to preach on that because I don't have a clue how that works. But he says you will even willfully sin. But a perfect revelation of, of perfect faith in the labor that Christ displayed will fix that problem. It will fix it every time. Le- faith in labor. Comes down to paragraph 345. He says, now my time's exactly up if I let out a little, little early. But I got a few more little things to say if you can stand it. Okay, if you have to. It's, it's just comical, saints. Thank God for a revelation. I mean, no doubt there were people sitting in this meeting that couldn't stand it. I mean, seriously, there, there had to have been people. You know, they had their supper cooking. They had friends coming over. They had plans. They had a long trip back home, whatever the situation was. No doubt there was somebody sitting there that couldn't stand anymore. But we can look at this now and we're like, I got you. I got you. I know what you're fixing to do right here. I've got a few more little things to say here if you can stand it. I know it's hot and I'm sweating, but listen, I just got something to tell you. It's just so good. It's just burning right in my heart. I hope you haven't forgotten it. Let me say this in the presence of him. Oh, my. Oh, my. By his grace, what's the fifth seal? By his grace, he also let me see my people Now remember, he just spent hours talking about souls under the altar, the Jews under the altar. But then he comes to the closing and says, I've got a few more little things to tell you if you can stand it. I hope you haven't forgotten it. By his grace, he also let me see my people. All he did? Tell me more. Not long ago, in white robes. What were those souls under the altar given? Wonder if that's a coincidence. I am not going to go start preaching on robes because we will be here for six hours. You study that yourself, praise God. I'll preach on it some other time if our pastor don't. You remember it? You remember the story? Not long ago, the Gentile bride, they're there now. Okay, this is not a wishy-washy statement, saints. This is an emphatic, direct statement. They're there now. What did he just reference before that? The Gentile bride. I'm not going to put you in or you out. You put yourself in or out. I'm going to put myself in there, though. You say, well, I don't know how that works. I haven't died yet. Quit worrying about how it works. It's a paradox. But he's vindicated, and me and you aren't. Yet. They're there now. Paragraph 390. And so he said, he's referring back to this translation. He calls it a vision a couple times, and he says, no, I don't want to call it a vision, but I don't want to say translation because people will think I'm making myself like Paul. He's, he's referring back to this situation. I'll say it that way. He says, and the people said, you, he said, I want to see Jesus. If I'm here, I want to see Jesus. He says, you can't see him now. He's still higher. See, it was below the altar. Oh, that's where the Jews were at. And that's where you saw the Gentile bride. Maybe this fifth seal's not just about Jews under the altar. But this is just a little thing he has to tell us if we can stand it. It's not really that important. So don't get excited. Praise the Lord, I'm about ready to do backflips. They're below the altar yet. I'm going to preach now, praise the Lord. The sixth place where man goes, not the seventh where God is. Seventh dimension, they're in the sixth. 
and they were all there and they was passing by. And I said, looked like there were actually millions of them. What a group. What a crowd. And his earthly ministry hasn't even ended yet, but yet he's already got millions of his people over there. That's interesting. His people. Are these Branhams? No, these aren't Branhams. These are your converts. These are your people. Now the Scripture, he that accepts a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward, takes on a whole new light. What was Brother Branham's reward? Remember the, the prophecy interpretation through Danny Hendrick. A huge portion of heaven awaits thee. Brother Branham says, well, it's not sectioned off like I own this much and I own this much. Heaven consists of the Word. And what are the believers? The words on the page. The words in the book. The loosed words in the book. The spiritual principles under the seals, which in, is the entire Bible, which is the last angel's message. See, I'm not ashamed to say that I am William Branham, Brother William Branham's people. And if you're ashamed of that, I've got real serious questions. He that will receive a prophet in the name of a prophet. It doesn't say to receive a prophet in the name of God. It says he that will receive a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. I am not ashamed to be identified with him. I am not, ash I'm not a Branhamite, but I'm not ashamed to be called a Branhamite. I am a Christian. But if you want to call me a Branhamite and you want to call me whatever word it is that associates me with him, I praise God. That just puts me in this vision, this translation. It puts me in this dimension. I'm not ashamed of that dimension and anything that it entails. Paragraph 411. Oh, this is wonderful. See, we're right under the altar. That's almost like he's saying present tense. Amen. We're right under the altar, see? That, see, where were we at when Christ was here on earth? Amen. Where did the spear go? It went right under the altar. For what purpose? To loose the bride. Why would we have a problem wrapping our minds that we're right under the altar? We were right under the altar before the, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Where do you think we were then? I'm going to say maybe under the altar. Where were we when he was here literally in a physical body? He proved it by running that fifth, that fifth wound up into his side. It showed where we were at. The book of Revelation that was, praise God, the book of Revelation that was given to John was to do what? Three things. Show what has been, what is and what will come. Why can we always believe what is? I'm sorry, what has been? No problems with what has been. When we start getting to what is and what will be, oh boy, better be careful. No, saints, if you have a revelation of what has been, you have no fear of what is and what will be. I was in the same place before the foundation of the world that I was when he was here on earth, and I am now in the, sa in the, in the position that I will be. Amen. Same place. My, my and your position never changes. It is right under the heart of God. You tell me how that mistake I'll say it real harshly. You tell me how that willful sin that you did two weeks ago is going to change that pattern. You're trying to tell me that your hybrid human willful carnal self can somehow disrupt the entire mind of God. Your position is sure. Your pos my position is sure. There is nothing we can do to change that position. 
You say, well, what about that scripture in Hebrews where it says if you willfully sin, you bypass and there's no more sac-. Brother Brand says, that don't even apply to a believer. Amen. Oh! <laughs> Praise God! If you want to put yourself in that chapter, you go ahead. I'm not putting myself in that chapter. Our position will not change. God made sure it wouldn't change to the fact that he would send a prophet and say, that portion of scripture does not apply to my bride because it's impossible for them to get there. Praise God for that. I hope you're starting to see how the fifth seal is not just some Jews that was killed by Eichmann, Stalin, Mussolini, and Hitler under this altar wanting vengeance for their brothers. What principle did it loose to us? It loosed to us that there's living people in that dimension, and the same dimension that John saw those people in is the same dimension that Brother Branham saw me and you in. Study the message. Study the message. Tell me if I'm out in left field. You tell me. I'm open to that. It's, it's not just in the message. It's through the Scripture, saints. To the point that, that there had to be four soldiers lift him into the heavens before they could display the fifth seal. It's so precise, it's shocking. 411, see, we're right under the altar. See, that was it. We're right under the altar. He's, he's not stuttering, he says it twice. We're right under the altar waiting for the coming when he, when go get the body sleeping in the dust to raise us again. Again, I'm not going to get into the whole body's side channel. I'm going to try not to get into the whole body's side channel of this because we just don't have time for that. What I want you to catch is the principle under this fifth seal of heavenly representation. It's not a frivolous representation, saints. That representation is more real than me and you sitting and standing here today. That representation is the whole reason you're able to sit there and me stand here today. It is more real than what's happening right now. It's not just a thought. It's not just a myth. It's not just... Uh, I hope that's right, or that's exciting. I wish it's that way. No, saints, that is the reality. This is the vapor. Paragraph 432. I'm going to have you stand up with me. I'm nowhere near done, but I want to get your blood circulating again. (laughs) While we read this, and then I'll have you sit down. 4.32, 4.32, it says, I just thought it would be a good place to inject that just before closing. See? If John looked over there and them was his brother, see his brother that he had, that had to suffer a little, then see the Lord permitted to see my brother and the saints that were waiting for the coming of the Lord. Are you his brother? Are you waiting for the coming of the Lord in the physical corporal body? In the seventh dimension, we know we've seen the spiritual coming. He's speaking here of the seventh dimension. Wait, they're under the altar waiting to go in the sixth dimension, waiting to go to the seventh. Waiting for the corporal body. And the saints that were waiting for the coming of the Lord, notice they were not under the altar of sacrifice. Mine wasn't. But the, speaking of the Jews, but these was, speaking of the Jews, they were martyrs. See, mine wasn't under the martyr's altar. Now, I want you to listen real close. <laughs> the, praise the Lord. The ones that the Lord showed me, the bride... She was not under the martyr's block. No, the sacrifice altar of the martyrs, but had received white robes. 
by accepting the pardoning grace of the living word. Christ had given them a white robe. You can sit down if you're able to. The Jews in the sixth dimension were given what? White robes. When? When were they given white robes? They did not come back to an earthly dimension to receive those white robes. He says he gave them to them then. But he says, mine wasn't under that martyr's block. Mine had already received white robes by receiving, praise God, the living word for their day. You tell me how secure your position is. He says, I have glorified him, and I'll glorify him again. If he did it at the first, he has to do it at the second. If he's glorified the bride once, he will glorify the bride again. He says, mine were not under the martyr's block. Mine already had white robes. They had already received the living word for their day. So now we have the key to why those Jews under the altar were given white robes. While they were in the sixth dimension, they received the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you here in a second. See how powerful the revelation of Jesus Christ is, saints? It surpasses dimensions. I can't, I'm not even going to try to preach on that. I, I've got no way to understand that. That's just astonishing. They had already been martyred under the Holocaust. Now, these were not all the Jews. Brother Brennan says these were not all the Jews. He says these were the true Jews, the true in heart, that kept the law just as much as they could keep it. So it's not everybody that was martyred under the Holocaust. It was the elect Jews, the true Jews. But he said they kept everything they could and they were truthfully blinded and they couldn't see, see Christ because he's the one that blinded them. But they go to the sixth dimension and they receive a white robe in the sixth dimension. The same as we, their robe that John saw is, let me say it this way, your robe that you have on now the white robe you have on now of the living word is just as real as those robes that they had on that John saw that's written in the scripture. You tell me how real your representation is. You tell me how powerful accepting the message of the hour is. Surpasses earthly thinking, surpasses carnal thinking totally heavenly dimension. Even now we are seated with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Not will be, we are now. I do think rather by the opening of this, this is the end of this quote. I do think rather by the opening of this seal as I believe that it's open to us. I did it with a good conscience, with clear revelation before God, not trying to just make it think, because I always against organization, never would belong to them, but it's open to me now. What did he just read right above that? What did he just say right above that? Why would he make a comment, the fifth seal is now open? Oh, what did he just say right above that? My group that received the living word is in the same position as those Jews under the altar that received white robes. Heavenly representation by faith in a laboring grace. Paragraph 436, and I do think another thing. By the opening of this fifth seal in this day straightens up a doctrine right here that I might speak of, of soul sleeping. Now I realize that there's people in here that does believe that, see, in the soul sleeping. I think this disproves that. They're not sleeping. They are alive. Their bodies are sleeping, but the soul, not in the grave, they're in the presence of God, see, 
under the altar. You say, oh, okay, now I can understand it because I'm kind of there, but my body's here. And when I die, my body will go there. Brother Brandon says, I hugged those people. I felt those people. I spoke to those people. You tell me how real that body is. It's more real than the one you have right now. It's imperative that we have faith in that. Because our intellects will not get us into that position. We must have faith in what the prophet has told us. We must have faith in the loosing of this seal. We cannot allow it to be just some information about Jews killed under the, holy, under the Holocaust that's now under the altar. We have to be a spiritual Gentile people and let this seal be loose to us. We have to have the courage to accept the challenge of the hour, which is the message of the hour. We have to get away from carnal traditional thinking of it's kind of like and it's maybe so. No, it is real. It's more real than real. And there's nothing you can do to change that. There's no mistake. There's no hybrid DNA. There's no family tree that can change that. Your faith in a perfect sacrifice, in a perfect, and don't leave that sacrifice 2,000 years ago. Your faith in a perfect bleeding, bloody word gives you a white robe now that is represented there in heaven. It is true and it is real. And we must have faith in that because carnal human intellectual faith will not change your atoms. It will not happen. We must have a, have a faith that is only loose to us by the loosing of this seal. He did not just loose this to us so that we could understand who the Jews were under the altar. He loosed it to us for rapturing faith. We must accept that. That's paragraph 436. He goes to paragraph 445 and he says, notice the Bible says, if this earthly tabernacle of our dwelling be dissolved, we have one already waiting. You tell me how real already waiting is. Brother Brandon says it was just slightly above my bed. I was there and I could look back and see the other. But while he's there, he talked to them, he felt them. His position was recognized. He recognized them. He even said some of them were ministers, and I didn't recognize them at first because they had been turned back young. But when I got, when I got the revelation that they'd been turned back young, I started to recognize them, and some of them were the ministers that I knew. I wonder if they were dead or alive. I wonder if it matters. It was real. Praise God. I'm going to finish reading that quote. Notice the Bible says, if this earthly tabernacle of our dwelling be dissolved, we have one already waiting. Direct quote, emphatic statement, that's where I seen those saints. It is not optional to think it's a kind of like or a maybe so. He said, that is where I saw them. He's vindicated. He was laboring with the message. Thousands of his friends will leave him. I'm going to have faith in his labor. You say, well, what good does that do you? Gets me a nice piece of clothing. <laughs> That's more real than this. More real than this. See, I can tear this one. I can ruin this one. I can get spots in it. I can get wrinkles in it. Nothing that I have done or ever will do can change that garment. That is His grace. Brother Branham says we talk so much about mercy and grace. 
He says, they thought God's grace was like a parent and nothing would ever happen to their baby. He says, God's love and His grace to us is His election. The fifth seal has everything to do with election. You cannot change election, saints. Not even if you try. You can't. And I... Thankful is not even the word for that. I can't put a word on that. How can you put a word on God electing to love you? And there's nothing you can do to change that. It is unconditional. The human mind, I tell you, if our human minds would ever really get a full comprehension of that, we would blow this building apart. That's why we have to have a body change, saints, because our body will not, when we receive that revelation in its fullness, we will not be able to handle it. This hybrid condition cannot handle that revelation. It has to change. It has to. And that's more real than we think of it, saints. You know as well as I do, you sit in service after service after service. And when the true inspired revealed word of God comes in its fullness to you and you accept it, things start happening in your body. You start sweating. You start shaking. Your body cannot handle this revelation in this hybrid condition. You tell me which is more real. It is so real and so powerful that for thousands of years of hybridization and carnality and sin, that just a God have mercy. A mortal man with faults and failures, nothing good within him, can pick up this spiritual principle, a spiritual principle that fell off the tree of life, and in his hybrid condition, can give it to you in your hybrid condition, and your atoms will start having a reaction and expressing itself in a physical way. Do not deny the reality of that. That is the same reality that the evil one displays every day in Walmart when they pierce themselves and tattoo themselves and cut themselves. What is it? It is that spirit in reality on their being bringing their body into subjection of that. It has a physical effect on their body and there is nothing they can do to control it. They can't help but cut themselves and pierce themselves and put ink on themselves. They can't help it. Their body cannot help it. You tell me which is more powerful, that satanic false expression or the true expression of the word of the living God. That same situation that we experience as the word is coming forth, that is the same situation that we're going to be put in when our atoms change. What is it? It is stimulation by revelation. It is oil and it is wine. And it is real. And it has a real effect, even in a hybrid condition. That's the truth. Praise the Lord. I know you know that it's the truth. God have mercy on us. Paragraph 455. Now, or to settle it, those souls, now watch this, under the altar of the breaking of this seal, that had been slain in the time between the death of Christ and the going up of the church, the Eichmann group, and all that, them true Jews with their names on the book. If you'll watch, my brother, according to the scripture, they could talk, cry out, speak, hear, and had all five senses, not sleeping in the grave unconscious. They were very much awake and could talk and speak and hear anything else. Why is that important? Because of the quote we've read just before that. He says, the same dimension these were in, my people were in. I'm going to read this quote and try not to have a screaming fit halfway through it. This is all the way back in 1953. Questions and answers on Genesis. And, bef- and God, 
before the world was ever formed, chose you and I in him before the world was ever formed. Now the first man now, he made the first man in his image, and we are returning back to that image, that's right, to our first created image. When God created me, William Branham, I was before the foundation of the world. He made my being, my spirit. I wasn't conscious of anything as far as I know of, but I was there. Oh, I don't believe you're getting it. You know why he said that? It's because the walls of the building didn't blow out. Because if they would have got what he was really saying, they would have blew the walls of the building out. But now, just a minute, Jesus told the disciples that he knew them before the foundation of the world. And Paul said here, he chose us in him before the world began. Now there was some part of me, Orman Neville, and the rest of you all here that's in Christ Jesus before the world ever began. And here's to my analysis of that. I think that the people today that are possessed of this spirit or the spirit, a part of these angelic beings, spirits which rotated off of God that never fell in the beginning and resisted the devil's lie in heaven. You say, okay, it was a part of me. It was something that rotated off of God. It's kind of like, it. forget it, saints. Just forget it. There was some part of you and me that resisted the devil's lie in heaven and kicked him out. Quit trying to put terminology on it. Or where, I won't say quit trying to put terminology. We should. That revelation will come. Don't lose the principle just because our intellect cannot put terminology on it. Allow it to be true and allow it to be real. This is all the way back in 1953 and his preaching never changed all the way to the fifth seal. You say, well, we kind of did that. We may, maybe in a way. Okay. I'm good with that because I'll say this. Whatever kind of that was, or maybe it was, or however it was, it was real enough that it kicked the devil out of heaven. You tell me how real that is. And he didn't just kind of come out of heaven. God himself said, I see you falling like a star. You tell me how real that was. The scripture says, Jesus says, those that I've justified, I have also glorified. He said, well, yeah, he will, he will glorify. No, he said, those that I have justified, I have already glorified. When you can explain to me how that works, I'll explain to you how this works. Should we be so worried about the mechanics that we leave the dynamics alone because we can't understand the mechanics and put it in a nice little box and explain it to somebody? No. We are a spiritual people who live on spiritual principles off of the tree of life. Whether I can explain that to you or somebody else or not, it doesn't change the spiritual principle and the truth that lies therein. Allow it to be true, saints. Be comfortable with saying, there was some part of me there. Even if I don't have the, termino- the revelation of the terminology to use in that, there was some part of me there. And if there was some part of me there, that's in an eternal position. So eventually, some part of me has to go back there. I'll worry about the terminology then if I need to. I'm pretty sure I won't be concerned about it. 
And I'm going to go one step farther. I'm not so convinced that he won't give us that revelation shortly. If we will allow the dynamics to be true, why wouldn't he give us the mechanics? See, you tell me which, which takes more faith. A clearly mechanical approach to something that results in a dynamic or believing in the dynamics and having the mechanics follow. Which takes more faith? What is the one thing the Son of Man is after? Why would, he not, why would he not put us in a position to make us have faith and make it more difficult to have faith? That's what he's after. He wants to put us in a position that we have to have something revealed to us in our heart and speak it as true and believe it as true and allow him to manifest the mechanics later because we're a spiritual people not a natural people. And he is after a spiritual bride. Praise the Lord. We've resisted the devil's lie. Praise God, I'm only an hour and a half in. Praise the Lord. We've resisted the devil's lie in heaven. Do you know what that means? Brother Branham said the same tale that he's telling now. He didn't say it was a lie. He said it was the lie. He says the lie that he told, the tale that he told. He says the same lie that he told there is the same lie that he's telling now. So if I was in a position that some part of me resisted the lie there, What is the chances that I'm going to somehow not identify and resist the same lie now? And I kicked him out there. What are the chances I'm not going to kick him out here? And what are the chances my mistakes and failures is going to disrupt that plan? Pretty slim, I'm going to say. One last question on that topic. I love this quote. Like, I could preach for days on this quote. I love it. If we resisted the devil's lie there in heaven and kicked Satan out, that sounds like a battle to me. He said, what happened in heaven spilled over and now takes place on earth in us. So is this the first time or the second time you've fought this battle? Revelation chapter 19, he comes with his army. You reckon that's a different army or maybe the same army? You say, well, I'd like one more witness, okay? There was this man, and he was looking at these pile of bones. And he says, can these live? He says, thou knowest. Prophesy. That sounds like a familiar commandment. Sounds like maybe in my position in Revelation 10, 8 through 11. Prophesy. And he says, I begin to prophesy. And the bones came together. But then some different skin from somewhere else, from somebody else came on them. And some different muscle from a different portion came. Oh, no. He said, the bones came together and sinew formed on them and muscles formed on them and tissue formed on them. And they stood and were a mighty marching army. That was not a different army. That was the same army army that was laying there. You say, okay, well, so what? So what? Get out of the chapter, get out of the first four seals. Look how secure your position is, saints. 
He said, you can go and be nothing more than a teaspoon of ashes. And that will not hinder your position in Christ. Those 16 elements will be, will be quickened. Those same 16 elements that went down will be quickened if they go down by way of the grave, if we're not translated. If we are translated, it'll be those, those same 16 elements that make you up right now will be translated, not a different. Same ones. That's how secure your position is in. And that's why your body reacts the way that it reacts when the preaching is going forth. The whole earth groaneth for the manifestations of the sons of God. He's not just talking about planet earth, saints. What is your and my body made of? We are a spiritual people that the spiritual principles off of the tree of life have a natural reaction and effect on our bodies. Continuing in the fifth seal, he says, now, but there is determined yet to the people, speaking of the Jews, another three and a half years. Well, during this time, he's speaking from the end of the church ages, to the three and a half years to the Jews beginning. Well, during this time, why, see what happens, is the Gentile bride is selected in the seven church ages and goes up. He's still in the fifth seal, saints. And he's talking about a Gentile bride in the church ages going up. And when it does that way, all these Jews that's martyred along here, there because of blindness, laying under the altar, God comes over and says, you see what it was? Now I give each one of you a robe. When did they receive a robe? After they saw what it was. What was it? He just told you. In between this time, the Gentile church goes up. Up where? I want to see Jesus. You can't see him now. He's a bit higher. Saints, when we're translated, we do not go to the sixth dimension. We see him as he is. What does that do to the sixth dimension? I'm not just making this up. He says it. It's just common. If the Gentile church, which he says, I already seen them there, where? In the sixth dimension. And he says, now in this time period, they go up. What does that do to the sixth dimension? Why do you think the Jews were crying? How long, Lord, how long is now the time? You think they just woke up one morning? Well, they don't sleep there, so they couldn't have woke up. You think that they just had an idea? Let's ask them how long. No, saints. They saw something. What they saw was the the sixth dimension emptied out of the Gentile bride. And they said, oh, how long, Lord? How long is now the time? And he says, you see what it was now? Yes, I give you a robe. What did they see, saints? There's only one way to get a robe, and that is to recognize the true atonement, the living word. You tell me what the bride is. The bride's position is so powerful that when the Jews recognize the revelation that laid within them, he gives them a robe of righteousness. They did not see Christ on a cross 2,000 years ago only. The sixth dimension emptied out. That's what caused them to ask the question. And he come over and he says, you see what it was now? How did they see what it was? Because of his position in his bride. You say, that's far-fetched. 
The scripture says he declares in heaven what he does before he declares it on earth. And Brother Branham says this Gentile, met the, this Gentile bride will take this same message and give it back to the Jews. He has to do it in heaven before he can do it in earth. Allow it to be true, saints. You say, I've never heard anything like that before. Neither have I. But you know what? What I heard before has not changed my atoms. So I'm going to keep looking for that city. And I'm going to keep looking for that city. And I'm going to keep probing and I'm going to keep looking. And I'm not going to go out in left field. I'm going to I'm gonna allow it to be by revelation. But when it's revelation, I'm going to say it. Whether somebody said it before or not, I don't care. I know it's true. It's in my heart. That's why I say I know that if I could just say it the way it's in my heart, it would be true and perfect because that's what revelation is. You tell me if your heart tells you it's true or not. Allow your heart to tell you. Don't trust my words. Allow your heart to tell you. And if your heart tells you that, don't worry about the mechanics. Allow him to fill in the mechanics. It's true, saints. The reason they were asking that question wasn't for a frivolous reason. They saw something. There was a reason they started asking that question. Why? Brother Branham told us why. He says, because my people are in the same dimension as those people. I've already saw them there. And the Gentile bride goes up. And they ask is now the time, Lord? Is now the time? Oh, you finally saw what it was. That's powerful, saints. It's powerful. See, if we ever really catch a revelation of this, the bobbed hair and the makeup and the shorts and the TV and the carnality just goes away. Look at the position he has gave us and look at what is hinging on it. This is so much more than your trials and tribulations while you're alone by yourself. Look, as what, is, look what is hinging on this. The robes of the Jews. See, if we can get off of earth out of carnality, recognize our spiritual position, the things of the world fade away and take care of themselves. As I've said before, there will come a day that we will not have to preach sanctification from the pulpit. The bride is going to catch a revelation. They do not need that. And I'll say one more thing. Just because it's not preached from the pulpit doesn't mean you're still not going to be held accountable for it. Just because something's not still preached doesn't mean that God's overlooking it. It just may be he's done dealing with that. And you best be moving on or you're going to end up on the pale horse. You allow that to speak to your heart. God is serious about this position the bride holds. And he's going to make sure that we fulfill that position. It's laid before the foundation of the world. It's laid when Christ was here at his first crucifixion. It was laid when the prophet revealed the seals. And then Brother Branham says he'll take that same thing that he revealed himself in before and reveal himself again. Do you think those thunders stopped whenever they sounded? What is the thunders? It's the voice of God. Where did he say the voice of God was? Look at our position, saints. Look how secure it is. What are the chances out of the billions of people that are on the face of the earth this morning that we are privileged to sit and hear these things? Not because I'm speaking it. God knows that. I'm, you understand what I'm saying. I'm just saying what he said. But I thank God for a revelation that I'm not a parrot and that I can speak by inspiration about what he said. Look at our position. I've got to move on. He says, he comes over and he says, you see what it was? 
Now I give each one of you a robe. They said, how long, Lord, are we going in now? Why would they ask if they were going in now? Enough said. No, 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 no. Your fellow man, the Jews, has got to suffer a little bit yet. They got to be martyred like you was martyred. The beast has got to get them when he breaks his covenant. See, Gentiles is individuals. Jews are together. Even in that dimension. It doesn't change. Even in that dimension, this same word of God applies. The Jews are saved together. Feast of Trumpets, paragraph 253. Notice, speaking of the Jews, they'll know their Messiah when they see him. He is coming in power this time, the one they looked for. He is coming in power for the Gentile bride. And the Jews are going to recognize him. That's funny. It's kind of like what happened in the sixth dimension. It's exactly like what happened in the sixth dimension. You just keep walking in the light. The mechanics will manifest that. Don't try to make it be something. You just keep walking in the light. It'll manifest itself. And the Jews are going to recognize him. Hmm, that must mean him. Hmm, that's male. Hmm, that's not what they saw in the sixth dimension. Or was it? Or was it? Thank God for a prophet. She is him. And then the Bible says, when they say, where did you get those wounds? He said, in the house of my friends. I wonder, this is just me, I wonder in the sixth dimension, when the bride goes up and the Jews see them go up and they recognize who they are and they have to because he comes over and says, you see what it was now? And they say yes and they were given rose. I wonder if that Gentile bride has scars. And I wonder if they ask the same question. And I wonder if the response is the same. Maybe that explains why I came and preached a message called indictment. See, the first crucifixion had scars. There's no way to avoid scars at the second crucifixion. You say, oh, Brother Branham manifested that. Yep, he sure did. Brother Branham's not here anymore. What's going to be slain now? Where are, the star- where are the scars going to be implemented now? You tell me who hurts you the most. The stranger at Walmart or your friends and your family? The ones that's walked with you for years and then denounced the very essence of this message. I wonder if those Jews see some scars on that Gentile bride. I wonder if they say, where did you get those? And they say, within the ranks of the message. Patterns laid, saints, we're not going to avoid it. Better get used to it. Who else can give you scars? You tell me that. The stranger at Walmart, is he may hurt your feelings. You may be embarrassed. He's not going to scar you. You're going to forget about it in a couple weeks. The house of your friends. Sixty-five, trying to do God a service without it being God's will. You see a tree struggling to live, and that means there's a tree that don't die. You see a man struggling for life. It shows that there's a tabernacle waiting somewhere that don't die. If this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have one already waiting. The good heavenly Father permitted me to walk behind that curtain one day and see it. This is in trying to do God a service without it being God's will. Why is he talking about the fifth seal? You recognize that as the fifth seal? Praise the Lord. This is in trying to do God a service without his will in 1965 at the end of his ministry. And he's going back to this same translation when he talks about we already have one there prepared. A body already prepared. He goes back to the exact same thing. Do you think that's coincidence? Not a chance. Father permitted me to walk behind that curtain one day and see it. How many heard? 
looking past the curtain of time. There it was, just the same as I'm preaching to you all. There they stood, souls under the altar crying, how long? Go back and look at that translation. You will find nowhere in there their souls saying how long. Maybe he's trying to tie something together. Maybe let's get off of the earth into heaven and see it. There's nowhere in the recount of that translation that there's anybody anybody saying how long, Lord, how long. But yet when he comes to the end of his ministry, 1965, trying to do God a service without it being in God's will, and he starts recounting this, he says, Father, get, Father allowed me to see that. And that's where they were. Those souls crying, how long, how long? Right. Not just a myth. Somebody who had intelligence. How long, Lord? See? They were real saints. That's what he's trying to get us to see. And they were there in that dimension. 1965, God's only provided place of worship. You who trust me to tell you the truth, the dear Lord Jesus, one morning about 8 o'clock, let me see that land. Now, it wasn't a vision. This is at the end of his ministry. He's not mincing words now. It wasn't a vision, but I don't want to say that. (laughs) Okay. Ever what it was, it was just as real as I'm speaking to you here. Now I seen the faces of those people and I couldn't recognize them. They had turned back young again and they were just real. I'd hold their hands and things just as real. I think he's trying to tell us something. And it helped me because I used to have an idea when a person died, just their soul went off. But, when, but then when he quoted that to me, that if this earthly tabernacle of our habitation be dissolved, we have one already waiting. That wasn't even a scripture the prophet put to it. He said, he quoted that to me. You tell me how real that is. See, and we've got to have everything in threes to make a perfection, see? And there's one body here, then there's that body there, which is the celestial body, and then the glorified body in the resurrection. I'm not going to get into that. I promised I wouldn't. See, that makes it complete. See, it's not a myth, not an idea. It's not a spirit. It is man and woman, like you are just exactly. In heaven or this place, wherever it was, I don't know what to call it. He referred to it there as souls under the altar. So you just thought I was making that up the whole time. The one that was speaking to Brother Branham, Brother Branham says he referred to that place as souls under the altar. And that's where me and you were at. And that's where he saw us. And he said, it's real. It's real. And then he said it again, it's real. What's the spiritual principle under the fifth seal? Heavenly representation. Laboring grace. Well, I could feel them. I'm going to skip this one because we've already got that point. And I looked at all the women Looked like millions of them there. And they all had long hair and white garments down. And this one that was talking to me said, don't you recognize her? I said, no. Said she was in her 90s when you led her to Christ. He starts singing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. What seal do you think he's talking about? See, just no way of ever explaining what it is. Just take my word if you believe me. Well, I'm one of your people, so I'll just believe you. Be sure to burn every bridge of the world behind you. Sixty-five things that are to be. I said, well, if I've passed over, I want to see Jesus. I'm going to skip that one because we've laid that down. He just makes reference again that even in 1960, I'll just read it. Well, I've passed over. I want to see Jesus. 
said, you can't see him now. This is the Scripture said, souls under the altar. 1965, end of his ministry, he goes back and says, that fifth seal, that translation that I had, this is that Scripture. See, there's, there's no wiggle room now. He gives a description. He places it in the Scripture. Souls under the altar. He's just a little higher. Someday he will return. We're going to go back to earth. We don't eat or drink here. 1965, it is the rising of the sun. And one day, you all know, some of you know this quote. I know you do. You just contain yourself. And one day when I was weary myself, I said, boy, you'd better go ahead and do something. You're 50 years old. If you're going to do anything for the Lord, you better hurry up and do it. You're getting old. See? And there that morning, the quickening power come. And he let me look over the curtain, and I seen all of you over there. No wonder everything in heaven and beneath the heavens and in earth and beneath the earth and in the sea and everything heard John screaming. If that doesn't do something for you, I've got nothing else to offer. Zero. Let's get some coloring books and some coffee and talk about a man on a cross 2,000 years ago. If that doesn't do something to your soul, I've got nothing else to offer you. This is at the end of his ministry. He's just laid out the spiritual principle is what was underneath that fifth seal. And he says, that's where I went and I saw all of you over there. Saints, he was not preaching to a bunch of dead people. These were still alive during his earthly ministry. And he said, I've seen you all there. Praise the Lord. Amen. What else can you say? Thank you, Jesus. What else can you say? Is it sure, saints? Yeah. Are you seeing it? Yes, sir. It's not intellectual. I'm not making this up. This is real. It's in the scripture. It's in the message. It's so true and accurate that when Jesus Christ was here displaying it in his earthly ministry, he had to act out each one of those, and they had to be precise. Yeah. But yet we come, and that low to see in spirit tries to creep over us. And we start trying to make it a kind of like or a maybe. No, it is real. And there's nothing you can do to change it. Amen. Nothing I can do to change it. And I say, thank God I cannot mess this up. He said that second Eve is not like the first. She will not fall. That's wonderful and it's glorious, but look at why she won't fall. He said, because she's predestinated not to fall. If we could mess this up, we would mess it up. But I thank God we can't mess it up. That's the spiritual principle under the fifth seal. Don't ever look at it as Jews under the altar again. Don't ever just look at it as Jews under the altar again. Praise the Lord. Oh, my. My, my, my. We're still in a time element. Cursed be time. My, 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 my. I'm going to stop. I wanted to get into the second crucifixion of the bride. But if I do, we're, it's just going to be really long. Let's, musicians come. Let me read this and we'll close. We'll get to the other some other time, God willing. I can give you the principle, and the principle is what happened at the first crucifixion will happen at the second crucifixion. And the reason he preached indictment is because there was a second crucifixion. And that second crucifixion didn't end in Brother Branham. That second crucifixion is in me and you. And that's why he would come and he would start quoting scriptures like she is smitten. She is afflicted. No, you can't do that, Brother Branham. The scripture says he was. He was afflicted. He wasn't stuttering. And he wasn't making up words. She's smitten. Smitten from the denominations. Don't leave that in the denominational world. Put that in your own mind. She is smitten from our own carnal thinking. She is smitten from just thinking it was Jews under the altar. She is afflicted of God. 
See, remember what I told you before, the fifth seal always comes into full manifestation after a crucifixion. Who do you think it is extending mercy and grace to this world right now? And if this fifth, if this fifth seal, if we're, if we're displaying grace to this world, laboring grace, it's not just grace, it's laboring grace. See, the book was, oh, Lord, have mercy. The book was sweet in the mouth and better in the belly. It was grace. What did the headstone cry when it came? Grace. Grace. W-I-W, -I, I can't spell, forgive me. W-H-I-T-E. S-T-O-N-E. Grace. Grace. Why isn't one grace good enough? Because under that fifth seal, when the headstone came with this revelation, there was grace extended to the Jews and there was grace extended to the Gentiles. Same headstone. No different. Grace. Grace from a white stone. If I be lifted up from the earth, is he still drawing men to him? Then where is he being lifted up at? Because the only way to draw men is for him to be lifted up from the earth. You say, I want to win a soul to Christ. Do you? Do you really? Because he says the only way to do that is if I be lifted up from the earth. You say, oh, that's when he was glorified. It was. Look at the definition that he put to glorification. If a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, if a man forsake his life. Totally opposite than what we think. But if we're in one position, that automatically puts us in the other position. Out of your belly will flow living waters. Oh, that's wonderful. Praise the God. Hallelujah. What do you have to do to get living waters to come out of your belly? You have to have a spear thrust into your side, right into your heart, and allow water and blood to come out. And that's real, saints. And that works. How are each and every one of you sitting here? How did you get here? How did I get here? It was faith in somebody else's laboring grace. Somebody labored and brought you this message. You say, oh, it's just my dad. You know, he was raised in No, 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 saints. Maybe it was, but it just wasn't that. There was a labor of grace that took place for you to hear these words. The prophet labored to bring us this message, and it didn't end there. That laboring came forth in the people that were on earth at that time that believed that message. They may not have understood everything, but that's okay. They believed what they could, and they labored in that through grace, and it gave it to the next generation. And that next generation picked it up, and they labored in grace clueless until this time that they were manifesting the revelation of the fifth seal. But now we're privileged to look back and see it. Why? That's the question. Why? Why is it important that we see it now? I'll tell you why. Praise the Lord. I, get, I really wanted to preach on this, but here's a good opportunity. I'll tell you why. Because a month ago, you can go to the news and find it yourself. A month ago, the first privately built spacecraft was sent into orbit mm -hmm. with no public show because of the coronavirus. That's a coincidence. Is it? It was a blip on the radar, saints, because there was the whole COVID-19 thing, and then there was all the riots on the earth. 
And just in the middle of all this, whoop, SpaceX, a private company, not a government proper, property, a private, a private show. No public show. They usually have tens of thousands of people at those launches. Not a one. I won't say not a one. There may have been a few there, but it wasn't like it used to be. It wasn't like it usually is. There was no big public show. I'm not going to make any more out of that than what it is. I'm just going to say, I, that's what the news said. I'm just saying what the news said. You, if you make it something else, that's your fault. I mean, if you think that has to do with something in a little room, that's your problem, not mine. Praise the Lord. That's why it's imperative that now we catch this revelation that's under the fifth seal. That's why it's imperative that we understand the grace that was released to us. Please start playing something or I'm going to preach all day. That was released to us. It is so imperative that we are secure in our position. Because our atoms are not going to change, saints, if we are not perfectly sure in our position. We have to be. And the only way that we will be perfectly secure in our position is if we recognize the spiritual principle under that fifth seal that was loose to us, and that principle was grace, grace, heavenly representation demonstrated in laboring grace. You allow your heart to tell you if it's true. You allow your heart to tell you if it's true. I'll ask you this question. Have you ever received scars in the house of your friends? Were they real scars? Were they real scars or were they in your spirit? See, they're not going to thank God Our lot is not the physical crucifixion. We're a spiritual people. So I just want to say that to bolster your faith. Saints, if they're crucifying you on a spiritual level, that must mean there's something there to crucify. And by default, by default, that establishes your position. So even if you can't bolster enough faith to say, yes, that's me, I'm, praise God, I'm in that position. Allow the negative to bolster your faith. Allow the negative to bolster your faith. Because I know one thing, the white horse rider didn't have no scars, and the red horse didn't, and the black horse didn't, and the pale horse didn't. So I can't identify there. But I come to the fifth seal, and I'm... Not, I'm not identified in the sixth seal of just causing trials and tribulation to everybody. But I can identify somewhere in that fifth seal I am. And I can identify what that means in regards to the seventh seal. See, it's by default. If you can't bolster enough faith just to proclaim it, do it by default. Because I'm pretty sure none of you want to walk out of here saying, yep, I am clearly in those first four. I don't think any of you want to say that. So by default, just say the other. And keep saying it. And keep saying it until you believe it. Or we can just say, I'm one of his people. I'm just going to take his word for it. I'm just going to believe what he has said about me. And I'm going to believe what was loosed to me. Praise the Lord. A lot more can be said. I'm going to stop there because I don't want you to walk out of here confused about the point that I was trying to make. Do you get the point I was trying to make? Do you understand your position? Do you have faith in that position? Against all odds, have faith in your position because that position has a heavenly representation. And it doesn't matter how much or what you do to change that, you can not. It's already there before the foundation of the world. It was demonstrated when Christ was here on earth in his corporal body. And it's demonstrated again as this message came forth. 
confirmed multiple times. Let's not go away doubting. As Brother Branham said, it would be a sin for us not to believe at this point. Let's not be sinful as we stand together. Let's be believers. Let's be believers. Let's just allow it to be true. I had you stand up, so that means I get to preach for a while longer, right? Just kidding. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your patience. I believe you've caught the point that's to be made. And I don't say that of myself. It's imperative that we understand this, saints. Brother Branham says the book was tied together from Genesis to Revelation by those seven seals. And those seven seals were the end of time message. Those seven seals were to us. Don't leave the fifth one to the Jews. Understand why that fifth seal applies to us. Praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. Please sing. Sing the original way. God's attributes were manifested to his bride in this last age. We have caught the revelation by the last prophet's message. We know who we are and what we're raised up for. Praise the Lord. Is your position secure? Amen. You know, when Brother Branham there at the end of his ministry, he looked out that crowd of people and he said, and I saw all of you over there. Yeah. Do you know, there would be people in that crowd who would disbelieve. That's right. yeah. Was he saying every individual in that building was guaranteed to be in the fifth dimension under grace? I don't believe that's what he was saying. No. Who was his audience and who was he preaching to? He was preaching to the bride. And if there happened to be somebody in that building who wasn't part of the bride, that's not who he was addressing. After the opening of the seals, Brother Branham quit, amen, trying to preach two different messages and evangelistic to this way. When he come back home, just preach something a little deeper. He finally got to the point where he was just preaching the seventh seal mystery, just preaching bride fruit wherever he went. And he was preaching bride fruit and the bride would catch it. The sheep would catch it and it would go over the heads of everybody else. And he got to the point he didn't care anymore. And he can come and make a statement like that. And I seen all of you over there. Who is he talking to? The bride. So when I listen to the tape and he says, I've seen all of you over there, who's his audience? 
He saw me over there. I believe with all my heart he saw me over there. Amen. What's the mechanics of it? Like Brother Ben said, I'm not going to try to explain it, but I just believe it that there's a representation over there of something that represents me in the heavenly dimension. It was before in God, part of God, returning back to God. We can use all kinds of English words to mess it up. We can try to explain it till we explain it away. We can try to categorize it and put it in timelines, but this is an eternal revelation. Forget the timelines. First it'll be like this and then it'll be like that. It's always been in the mind of God the same thing. God, his attributes, his family. Do you believe you're part of that? Amen. Then you have representation in heaven. Then you're sealed. Then you're under the fifth seal. And the loosing of the fifth seal brought a revelation of your eternal position. And now I'm secure. If I get sick, it doesn't change that. If I lose everything, it doesn't change that. If my family falls apart, it doesn't change that. If my church falls apart, it doesn't change that. Nothing's going to change that. That's a revelation that we needed under the seals so that we can move with confidence the way God wants us to move. Brother Bram, what did he say? He, he's trying to take the scare away. All this fear and scare that the denominational age has created, all this fear and scare, you better get it right or you'll be lost. If you make a mistake, you'll be lost. You better come to the church, you'll be lost. You better listen to the preacher, you'll be lost. What's the seals trying to do? What's the revelation they are trying to do? Take all the scare away. Amen. There's nothing for me to be scared of. There's nothing to be afraid of. Amen. My position is secure in him. Amen. I've come from him. I go back to him. Whatever he is, I am. Amen. She is him. Praise God. How much? How much of you, the flesh and the... I don't care how much. One speck's enough for me. One dot, one drop, one. How do you measure it? How do you put it in a portion? How do you divide it up? I don't know how to divide up. I don't know how to separate it. I'm not interested in separating it. Three parts, one part. I'm part of him. That's enough for me. Amen. Amen. However he wants to manifest it in whatever way and through whatever terms, it doesn't matter. I'm part of him, period. I'm secure. I'll go back to him. I love him. Do you love him? Man, let's just bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for the revelation that you gave us. Lord, when you, when you sent that prophet to us according to your word, that was you, Lord. We can look and see a man, but that's just the vessel you chose. It was you who was loosing the seals. It was you who was bringing the revelation to us. And God, now it's not us. It's not the man behind the pulpit or the people in the seats. It's not the clay. It's you on the inside, Lord. It's not us that's persecuted as a human being. They love us. People like us. It's not the flesh. It's not us. It's, it's the word that is inside of us. Lord, we're not rejected. You're rejected. And because we're identified with you, it just passes right on. We feel it because you're abiding within. It's your presence with your bride. God, and it's not the mistakes. It's not the wrong thoughts. It's not the ill-tempered words. That's not what it's all about. It's about that life on the inside. God, give us more, Lord, more understanding of your grace so that we can quit looking to the outside and look to the inside. For the revelation of this truth, it will solve all problems. Lift us up in a higher plane as your people, Lord. Give us a different eyesight than natural eyesight, a different understanding than natural understanding, that we might see the reality of these things and we might perceive the real truth of this reality, Lord. And may it change our walk, may it change our talk, may it change our everyday actions, Lord. Not changed, Lord, by force, not changed by governments, not changed by rules, Lord, but changed by revelation. May you have preeminence by revelation. God, may you have your position, your place, because you've come and revealed to us so that, you, so that we can yield to you and that you can have your way. 
Forgive us, Lord, for our blindness, Lord. But now, as you shine the light, Lord, let us come to the light and walk in the light. God, we love you. We ask that you take us from here to higher places, to higher realms. As we physically walk out of the building, let us not leave the position you've placed us in. Well, let's not leave that heavenly realm, no matter where we go or what we do. Let us never, Lord, in our revelation, leave our position. Let us walk on this earth as you would walk, Lord, doing what you would have us to do. We surrender to you, Lord. We ask you to have preeminence. Bless our brother Ben, Lord, for his sacrifice and his labor. God, as we fed, Lord, from what you've done through him, we just pray that you restore to him strength and energy, Lord, and revelation and blessing. For God, we desire to walk a walk of faith by revelation. Not, not just mechanical, what we can see and feel and touch, but what we can receive by faith. Let that be the greater reality, Lord. God, take us, use us, mold us, and make us, Lord, what you've always predestined for us to be. Help us, Lord, to get with the program so that your program can continue to move forward more quickly. We love you, God, and ask for your blessings over all said and done. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, saints. I tell you, I've been praying a prayer for me personally. That prayer is that God will let me preach by revelation. And it, it's risky, seemingly. I should say it's seemingly risky to the human mind. Because if you're going to preach by revelation, you're going to preach things that you can't always prove, and you're going to preach things that you haven't always known, and you're going to preach things that may not be easily understandable to the intellect, but I want to get away from all of those things, and I want to preach by revelation. And God blessed our brother today to be able to preach by revelation, amen, because the denominations have been able to preach by intellect, by schooling, and by education, but we want to do away with all of that, and we want to preach and speak and testify by revelation, because revelation is everything. And then trust God, amen, to lead us by revelation. It seems risky, but it's the most solid foundation you can ever be on, is be on the solid foundation of revelation, amen. Understanding is the tricky part. Understanding is the deceptive part, this intellectual understanding that can all fade away and fall apart, but revelation will last forever. True revelation from God. And I said, God, let us be led, let us preach, let us speak, let us testify, let us read your word, let us listen to tapes, all by revelation. Let us forget all that we've ever known to know him. Praise be to God. Let's sing. You have a song. Sing this path. Oh, I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord.
Moses had broke the tables of stone. And he got two more. He told to cut two more out and he was going to go unto the mountain and God was going to write on those stones. It says, God came down in a cloud and declared the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? It's not being able to spell Jesus Christ or just say it, amen? But his name denotes his person, who he is, and he is the person of the word, amen? And he came down in a cloud in this generation, amen, so that he can declare his name, who he is. And that's the opening of the seals. That's the message of the hour. That is this seventh seal. He has come himself to declare his name. And when we bring honor to his name, it's not just the technical letters and the writing and the alphabet and being able to sound it out and pronounce it, but he came in the cloud to declare his name. Oh, praise be to God. I want to worship that name and I want to praise that name and I want to declare and give honor to that name which represents him himself who is here present, the one who's breaking the bread. And let's sing that song again with revelation, amen. With the revelation of who we are and who he is and what his name is. Amen, let's sing it again. I sing praises to your name.
Bring me 